everyone, I'm Transformers Fanco 328 here. It's not about what you do differently, it's about what you do well. So, Bionicle G2 has ended. I'm somewhat upset, but mostly indifferent. I say this because with how poorly LEGO pushed this line, the line carrying the name of the brand that saved the company, with a truly compelling narrative and how much they resembled Hero Factory sets, and speaking from a casual buyer perspective, by the mere fact that they used many of the same pieces, or even coming out around the time when Star Wars was getting its game back, which LEGO had to push as well, it's really no surprise that the line ended. Really, I was hoping we'd at least get one more wave for a final battle type situation. Give us the Makuta and the Mask of Ultimate Power and whatnot. But we were denied even that, and we had to go out and buy a bunch of other sets to make him, and not only does he look... eh, but we won't even be getting the Mask of Ultimate Power! It's clear how much of an apologist I was towards this generation of Bionicle, but I still stand by the sets being really good. Tahoe was a nice rush of nostalgia, and a fun figure to play around with, Hikima was a strong two-pack of interesting characters of clashing visual identities, and Umarak the Hunter is among my favorite Bionicle sets, period. What I think was the line's biggest failure was the lack of a fully compelling narrative. Well, lack of marketing as well, but a good story is more important than people think. While I still think the 2015 web animations had a strong opening episode with the legend, creating a great backbone for future stories, not many of those seemed to be told. And instead what we got was an incredibly brief narrative spread too thin with next to no character on either side of the conflict, especially the villains. Without memorable or interesting characters or a storyline worth following, most kids don't have much of a reason to buy, say, a Skull Basher over Kylo Ren from that awesome Star Wars movie. All these sets had going for them were the nostalgia factor and designs, which could attract some, but it clearly wasn't enough to keep the line afloat. And by the time the books rolled around to further flesh out the world, it was far too late. But that wasn't the only way they tried to visually tell these stories, as we see in 2016's Bionicle, Journey to One. As it seemed that Netflix was starting to gain more traction as a viable platform for awesome shows, it only makes sense that Bionicle would start its own long-deserved animated show there. Unfortunately, besides how it barely showed up in Netflix's top results, even when it was first released, Journey to One was rife with some major issues that ultimately made it hard to find a lot of enjoyment from, regardless of which perspective you're seeing this from. So let's finish off this Bionicle film review saga, so to speak, with Bionicle Journey to One. Before I begin, I would like to give a big shout out to A Screen Legend for the footage. I couldn't find any way to get the episodes, and I still don't have a capture card, which even if I did, I'd probably have a hard time making it work since my Netflix TV is in a room well away from my computer, but she offered to share with me her recording she has for a bridge series. This review wouldn't be possible without her. Anyways, on to the review. So we begin with Narmoto giving the Akodens a recap of the 2015 web animations, which is fine for a newcomer, but it's jarring since they straight up reused the footage from the web animations. <laughs> In contrast to the new footage, which is clearly done in a more CG cartoon fashion. I do have to admit that the animation is pretty good. The lighting, the colors, and the motion they utilize is visually engaging and makes the people of the world feel more believable, while utilizing a cell shading that gives the impression of a cartoon and maintaining accuracy to the sets. It's strange how they seem to have removed Narmoda's exposed jaw, but overall it's a very appealing art style. At least for me. So far, so good. What's next? A fight scene that establishes our heroes and their improved power thanks to the armor Akimu crafted for them in the first episode. Quest for Unity. Huh. Nothing that warrants an over-the-top reaction. Proceed. They dispose of the threat with minimal trouble, and then Akimu immediately tasks them with finding MORE golden masks in an end goal which involves finding one of the three ancient masks. And there's going to be little enemies nagging at them as they search for them. Aside from the elemental creatures that Toa will befriend along the way, which can be argued as an equivalent to the protectors that guided them last time, this is pretty much a repeat of last year's early story. Not that the early years of G1 didn't run into plot repeats, as most of the Matanui saga from the Toa's perspective were collectathons, but they had the world building and characters to make up for it. Here? The Toa come across as rather basic, not really showing off a distinct personality despite being given far more screen time than last time. As if the writers assumed that the narrative would carry the show, instead of the characters that go on this rather overdone quest. Granted, there is some degree of individual characterization, especially with Lewa's energetic demeanor, but honestly the shadow traps show much more personality in a few seconds than some of the Toa do throughout multiple episodes, like Golly. For that matter, Pohatu's characterization is surprisingly inconsistent with the 2015 web animations, which is strange seeing as how they not only have the web animations for reference, but even mention his character in the recap! The brooding Pohatu was the most serious of the group. In that, he was basically Australian Batman. Here, he's just like the others save Lewa, except with his fear of awkward sets carried over. <laughs> Speaking of 
which I do enjoy the interactions the Toa have with their respective creatures. Leiwa gets knocked around by Uxar and challenges him to a race to the Tree of Beginning. Kopaka and Melon face off against each other. Tarak acts as our newest tour guide through the maze he was smashing his way through before. Huantu is frightened by what Katara resembles. It's just fun to see how the creatures interact with the Toa. Especially Tarak going, Oh, okay, follow me. I like the Toa enough to keep watching, but I would have liked a little more personality to the characters we'll be following for the entire show. Whatever. In the middle of Leiwa's race, Uxar gets caught by our villain, Umarak the Hunter. Fun fact, according to the official Bionicle website, Umarak's name in the Akotan language means Shadow Hunter. So is Shadow Hunter the Hunter a better villain than the Skull villains from the web animations? Well, barely. He states that he's only serving Makuta to meet his own ends, and he's really only loyal to himself. I hunt for Makuta, it is true. But I am certain no one. But that's about the biggest defining characteristic about him. I do like how he utilizes the shadows for mobility and creature capturing, and he even pulls a couple Battletoads moves on Leiwa. But otherwise, he's as generic as a villain gets. I was hoping we'd have gotten some kind of witty mastermind type character. One that could face a Toa both physically and mentally. But I suppose we could have gotten worse. Anyways, Leiwa manages to subdue Umarak for now, and the Toa gain their golden masks, forging a unity with their elemental creatures in the process. I am ready. I am ready. I am ready. I'm ready! Their newfound connection to the creatures tells them where the next level, I mean the labyrinth where the mask of control is, and they meet Akimu to keep him up to date. This leads into episode 2, Trials of the Toa. I do like how they show, even if briefly, how the citizens of Okoto are slowly but surely rebuilding the ancient city. It just makes Okoto civilization feel alive. However, this attempt at slapstick isn't quite effective. Tahu's crash landing happens far too slowly to get a good laugh out of me. Plus, the shift from joy to fright isn't jarring enough to make it work. Let Matau show you how it's done. <laughs> now that's comedy! As the Toa begin their trek to the Mask of Control's labyrinth, Umarak discusses with Makuta that he'll seek out the weakest link to the Toa creature unifications. Before Journey to One came out, it seemed like Leewa's Yanma would have been said weak link, given how Leewa has been the franchise's resident butt monkey and how well Uxar gels with Umarak's design and color scheme. Granted, we did see a taste of that during the first episode, and what we're shown gives us a different conclusion. We get another fight with Umarak, where we do see some of that cunning I was hoping to get out of him, determining through the Toa's actions which of them had the worst connection with their creatures. You may notice that neither Gali nor Kopaka unite with their creatures, but aside from Gali's being more suited for underwater anyway, Kohatu and Kitara made the effort to avoid each other, compared to Gali's choice to save Akita from a direct attack, so Shadowhunter the Hunter was able to figure things out easily. Meanwhile, they race each other to the maze, claiming the unification is for practicing purposes, and the race itself is quite a bit of fun, mostly due to seeing these mighty heroes intentionally mess with each other. Kopaka freezing Gali's water, early when pulling seaweed to trip up Tahu. It's quite a decent throw ride. It probably could have used more energetic music, though. Hey! Find if I hit a ride? The generic orchestra they've been using throughout the show doesn't work for a faster-paced race scene. There's so much we don't know about our past. Maybe whoever built this maze has something to do with us. Oh yeah, your backstory is, uh... Was that ever an important plot point? You never really stressed it until now. The Toan creatures make it past the most advanced crushing blocks whatever currency Okoto uses can buy, and they make it to the chamber where the mask of control is hidden. Shall I follow? Of course you should! Where else do you think my mask is, Metro Nui? I don't think that- Show my fool the damn tower! Okay, okay. Sidless bastard. Umara takes advantage of Pohatu's reluctance to unite, and takes the mask of control by using guitar. Pohatu gives chase and pulls off a couple of awesome direct hits on Shadow Hunter the Hunter, but our villain forces Pohatu to save Kitar while he regains the mask. Although with the way they presented it, Pohatu could have easily kept on his course for the mask and ran after Kitar once he got it. Nothing was really stopping him. Anyways, Umarak escapes with the mask, the Toa Stata, our friends are our power message, and Makuta uses the mask to corrupt Umarak into a cool looking but personality free monster which concludes Journey to One's first season. In a sense, these episodes complementing the Winter Wave are considered season one, while the Summer Wave episodes are seen as a season two. Even with a TV show, Bionicle still can't get past the two hour mark. And this is the longest one yet! Anyways, episode three, Destroyer's Game. 
Wait, does that mean we're gonna see the Toa face off against Desatroya? Desatroya! Actually, no. It's just a battle against the characterless elemental beast while Shadow Hunter the Destroyer goes on his own Easter egg hunt for the pieces of the Mask of Ultimate Power. Done mostly off screen, which I'm thankful for given how much Bionicle repeated the island wide search for powerful objects story arc. That's about the gist of this episode. It does show Akimu powering up and calling upon a regional magazine exclusive bird, and we see Umarak raise up a volcano affected by Unicron, but otherwise the episode is rather light on content. This leads us to the final episode of the show. The Dark Portal. We get informed that Makuta's disappearance was caused by the Mask of Ultimate Power, banishing him to the Shadow Realm. And that's not my F-grade reviewer Smack Talk, that's really what they call it. Makuta doesn't have the power to open the door to the Shadow Realm. Ikima manages to slightly damage Umarak by using Flash, but Gali goes for the winning move. The result? She loses her soul. Gali's spirit is strong, but we have lost her to the Shadow Realm. And not a single children's card game was played that day. Forgive me, I don't have any Yu-Gi-Oh cards. We see Gali in the Shadow Realm. A well-done creepy place full of what appear to be Shadow Akotans and other enemies rallied by the mutated form of Makuta, who, as I said, looks eh, but the shading makes him feel more intimidating. Our ancient code demands we never reveal the prophecy recorded in the Temple of Light. Ikimu will honor that vow, even if that means the Toa will never know their true power. Really? Another bullshit Vala curse? <laughs> I mean, why must they never reveal the prophecy told in the Temple of Light? Would the universe just implode right then and there? You guys are the elements. And also Dark... Though to be fair, the possibilities that could come from the premise of being lost in a world ruled by the big bad of the story would be epic. Wait, this is the last part of the story? And we only have four minutes left? Well, shit! Golly escaped! We're the elements! We banish you to four kids with our Bionicle 2 reference, Makuta! That is the way of the Bionicle. Wow! I... I don't think I've seen something this rushed. Like... Ever! And for a Lego theme, this ending is pretty damn conclusive. I mean, how are we gonna help continue this line's legacy if you literally cut it off with next to no hanging threads for us fans to expand upon with our own stories? At least Bionicle G1 ended in an open-ended fashion for not only those official expanded serials, but also for our imaginations to go wild. Here, they just told us to get the fuck out, turned away, and slammed the door in our faces. And this is how my childhood toy line ends? I... I'm so sorry! The first few episodes are alright for a few decent moments, and the animation is pretty good, but the characters are basic and barely developed, if not inconsistent with their prior counterparts. Our villain is not much better than last year's assortment, the voice acting is nothing to write home about, the action just seems to lack that oomph to make those scenes feel engaging, and the pacing of the last two episodes are god-awful, especially the ending. For what was supposed to be a Bionicle TV show, in a sense, the potential squandered is unbelievable and the resulting product isn't very strong on its own merits. But no matter how much they screwed the pooch on this, I will always love Bionicle as a whole. G2 had some cool sets and a good beginning lore, and I'll always appreciate that about it. I give it a sincere farewell for the brief two years it's been around for. And G1? My god, that's a series I would never want to forget. The characters, the worlds, the culture, the toys that accompanied every tale told. So much about the old series was fantastic. Never flawless, but a staple of my childhood that I was more than happy to revisit. It's a shame that G2 didn't sell very well, so Bionicle's future is uncertain in that regard, but as long as we all remember the good times, it will never go away. Thanks for joining me, and while this may not be my very last Bionicle review, I'm certainly done with their film adaptations. I'm Transformers Fanco 328 and remember to maintain your unity, fulfill your duty, and find your destiny. For well, that is the way of the Bionicle. Bionic Chronicle, in case you've been wondering.